to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. Let, let me lead with a very general question. I read an excerpt from Marshall's honorary degree at Harvard. Each of these has been described as an indispensable man. Were Washington and Marshall the indispensable men of their age? I, I would say most definitely yes, that, that uh, Washington was the indispensable man of the, the late 18th century and at the time when we won our independence and established the country. That phrase, I believe, was first applied to him by the biographer James Thomas Weston in the 1970s. I don't think there is anyone else who could have stepped forward and led the American army to success through so much defeat, so much travail, so much shortage of everything that you can think of, really by the strength of his, of his character and by the example that, that, that he set, and by his confidence in the, in the eventual outcome. And, um, Jefferson said something about him. Jefferson did not like Washington, but he did say a few things about him that were, that were true. Uh, and he said that, that Washington, because he lacked imagination, took a long time to make up his mind, but once he had made up his mind, he was sure in his conclusion. And Washington had set his mind to defending America against what he first called the parliamentary army, and then winning our independence. And by acclaim, he became the ind indispensable man when the country, the nation, was founded legally. He was summoned to be president of the, Con the Constitutional Convention, although they, it didn't begin that way, but it became that. And then when the, the convention wrote a description of the presidential powers, it has often been said that they were looking at the man on the dais describing the position that they hoped that he would take. And, and as, as, you, as many of you know, he was elected president unanimously in the, in the electoral college and, and served two terms. And no one, probably no one, could, could have held the early union together the way, the way that he did. So I, I would say that unquestionably, he was the indispensable man, even though he, he, had, uh, he ran into a lot of opposition. Washington sometimes had trouble ru ruling his own spirit because he was famous for his temper and uh, his, his outburst and his uh, associates trembled when they could see one coming and, and looked, to the, looked to the exit. But he, uh, like George Marshall, he was a man of great self-control self and he struggled his whole, his whole life, his whole military life and political life to, to keep his, his feelings uh, under control. As a... Um, Virginia planter, uh, he was very conscious of his elevated social position. Uh, he thought that there were certain men, especially men, uh, who occupied the highest tier of society and deserved a measure of, of deference. But he also did believe in a, a fundamental equality of the type that, that, that Jefferson articulated in the, uh, in the Declaration. He was a man of, I mean, Character is, is kind of a it, it's a it's a it's a broad term and and he, he was and in contrast to uh, to what we just heard about uh, Marshall turning down Overlord, George Washington Washington was a man of ambition. He wanted command of the Continental Army uh, at the war, and he sh he showed up before at, in front of the con at the Continental Congress as a delegate wearing a military uniform. When they knew, when he knew that they were looking for a commander, and at over six feet tall, he was you know, extremely impressive. He was extremely handsome, and there he is in his resplendent uniform. And all the other delegates, well, virtually all the other delegates, had little or no military experience. So whom do they choose but uh, George Washington? And he he expected that, and he and he wanted it. And there there's another lesser-known aspect of his career that shows his, uh, his, um, his sense of his station in life and his, not quite his ambition, I hate to use the word greed, but uh, he would take what he thought 
that was coming to him. When he served with the British in, in what we call the French and Indian War, at the end of the war, the enlisted men who were not paid very much were given royal land grants out in the Ohio Valley and in, in western Pennsylvania and farther west. This was not meant for officers. It was meant for the common soldiers. Washington knew that it was a tradition in, in the British um, military to reward leading officers with big grants of land and dukedoms and earldoms and all this sort of thing. And he didn't like the idea that he wasn't getting anything. So he managed to get his hands on some of these land patents. And also, he went to some of the soldiers who got them legitimately and offered them a few dollars here and there on the side. And in, in so doing, acquired quite a bit of land in the, in, uh, in the back country. And it was Joel Aschenbach who turned this up when he wrote his book on the, um, on the, on the Potomac River uh, several, several years ago. And, but in other aspects of, the, of his character, I mean, Washington is, is by and large unassailable. I mean, his, his courage, his commitment, his willingness to suffer by the side of his, of his men under terrible conditions, uh, it, he always inspired, inspired loyalty. And uh, that was really one of the most important things that carried us through, through the war was the fact that um, his army was consistently loyal to him. Let me say something about, um, Marshall wasn't perfect. Uh, and he had, similar to Washington, he had a temper um, uh, that, that was explosive. Um, and that was one of his uh, shortcomings. He told an interviewer when he was 75 years old that his biggest problem in public life was uh, controlling uh, his temper. And there was a, a famous incident uh, in his life. There was a showdown when he was Secretary of State, 1948, May of May 13, 1948. Um, there was a showdown in the Oval Office with him, with uh, President Harry Truman. Uh, <clears throat> over the issue of the, the immediate recognition by the United States of the new state of Israel, which was going to be declared on May 15, 1948. This was a presidential election year. And in the room, uh, debating, it was a debate. Uh, Truman set up a debate between Clark Clifford on the, on the, on the side of recognition. Clifford was told to uh, prepare like it was a Supreme Court argument. And on the other side was uh, Marshall and Lovett. Uh, and they represented the entire national security establishment at the time that opposed the immediate recognition of Israel. Uh, and, and Truman had already basically made up his mind he was going to do it, but he wanted to hear the, uh, hear the argument. And while Clifford was making his argument, Roosevelt, or, uh, Marshall's face got redder and redder. Um, he thought it was political. This was uh, an election year, 48. Truman was running for the presidency for the first time uh, against uh, Tom Dewey. Um, and Clifford was a political advisor. So Marshall's face got redder and redder, and then he lost uh, in front of everyone. Uh, and he, uh, he, he said, uh, he said to the to Truman, um, you know, Mr. President, that I, do, that I do not vote. But if I were to vote in this coming election, I would not vote for you. And the room uh, remained, became silent and cleared the room. And uh, after everyone had left, leaving only Truman and Clifford in the Oval Office, uh, Truman said that, Clifford, well, that was rough as a cob, an old Missouri farmer's expression. Um, and Clifford thought he had lost the argument, but he didn't. Uh, there's more to that story. But it's a, it is an example of, of uh, probably uh, one of the most famous incidents in which he lost his country. Washington, after he was uh, appointed commander of the American Army, he, he went up to uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the main encampment was I mean, in, in July of 1775. We had just lost the Battle of, of Bunker Hill, and we, well, we won it by losing it by 
killing so many uh, British officers, and you know, the commander said, I wish this first place was burned. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting things to me, having written a book about George Washington and slavery, is about how he managed to, to, to allow black men to serve at the beginning because he needed them. And also, he, I guess he decided he wanted them. When he got to New England, he was shocked to, to find on Cambridge Common black men walking around carrying muskets, part of the army. And a Virginia planter was not accustomed to seeing this sort of thing unless he had given one of his trusted men a pass to go hunting. Um, and so he met with his general staff and they immediately kicked all of the black men out of, out of the army. And almost immediately afterwards, a, a delegation of these African Americans came to headquarters and complained in Washington words, Washington words, very much at being discarded. They wanted to fight, and they wanted, and they could have gone. They could have gone across the lines and been paid by the British, but they wanted to fight for the American cause. They believed in this idea of, of, of freedom, and they thought they would have a part of it. The other thing that happened is that he received the, either in, uh, by a messenger or probably by a messenger a poem, a poem written by a woman born in Africa, who was transported to here and to Boston, enslaved, dumped on a wharf at the age of six or seven, and a, a, a wealthy family in Boston took pity on her. Her name was Phyllis Wheatley. They, that's where they gave her the name, Phyllis Wheatley. She was brilliant. She was a, a Latin scholar by the time she was in her teens, and she was writing and publishing poetry. And as a young woman, I think she was still in her late teens or early 20s, she wrote a long poem in tribute to the American cause, and specifically to the American army and to George Washington in particular. And it was delivered to him, and he was amazed to read this. So amazed that he arranged to have it published in the leading American journal, and he invited Phyllis Wheatley to uh, join him, to come and meet with him at his headquarters in Cambridge. Now, this is more than a footnote to American history, because it was shortly after this that Washington went to uh, his committee of, of top officers and said, you know, we're going to change course. We are going to allow black men to fight in the American army. And my contention in the book is that he was moved by the expressions of loyalty from the black, the discarded black men who came back and said, let us fight, and by the poetic expression of loyalty by Phyllis Wheatley. He was also worried about Virginia's royal, royal governor, Dunmore, who was trying to recruit slaves down, in, down here. Uh, but the, I think that the, the and, and then from that moment, the Revolutionary Army was integrated, and uh, it was. And Washington wanted to spread the black men throughout the army. He said that he, that he did not want even to have the appearance of there being a black corps. He didn't want a, a segregated army. And uh, at, at, there, there is a report which some scholars question that at one point one of the regiments was three quarters black. The wrote first Rhode Island regiment. But the, the general thinking that in its entirety, the army had somewhere, be, you know, it varied between 5 and 6 percent and 15 percent African American participation. So the African American presence was very important in the building of Washington's army. And I will say in conclusion that the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, which was heavily black, was recruited with Washington's direct permission at, from Valley Forge when he knew that the revolution was hanging in the balance, and the Rhode Island officer came to him and said, I can get you a regiment of, of African and Native American fighters if you'll agree. And he said, you bet, go get them. So Marshall, uh, 1939 and 40, was chief of staff. He had an army of less than 200,000 men. It was ranked uh, 19th or 20th in the world in terms of size. Virtually had nothing. And uh, when Hitler, in the beginning of 1940, Hitler basically overran all of uh, Europe, um, defeated the French, um, the president was still reluctant. It was peace time. Uh, we faced the possibility of war in Germany and also in Japan at that time. Um, the president was reluctant to go ahead of public opinion. Public opinion was against a war, going into war, sending our boys over. Um, and 
it was ruled by isolationists in Congress. But by June of 1940, when uh, Europe was overrun, Marshall uh, was beside himself. Uh, how was he going to uh, have an army that could possibly take on the Germans and possibly the Japanese? And so he picked, he picked a spot on May 13th, 1940. And at this time, Roosevelt was actually actively considering cutting the military budget. He got into the Oval Office with, with Henry Morgenthau, the Treasury Secretary, um, and uh, the President blew off uh, Morgenthau, who was trying to advocate. And Marshall stepped forward and he stood over uh, Roosevelt, who was in a wheelchair, deliberately, I think. He said, Mr. President, may I have three minutes? Um, and he said, I, I'm not used to talking to presidents. Uh, and he wasn't by that time. Uh, he had stayed mainly in the background. Um, but I have to tell you, you need to do something, and you need to do it right now. And then he laid out what, what needed to be done. <clears throat> and within three days, uh, Roosevelt called Marshall back into the office, and they sat down and they worked out the beginnings of the, uh, the money that they would need from Congress to just begin to raise uh, an army. Now, what Marshall needed to, to raise an army was money. He was about to get that. He needed manpower. He needed ma war material, equipment, planes, tanks, and so on. He needed talent. <clears throat> so the next step after money was manpower. Roosevelt would not advocate a draft <clears throat> um, in 1940, at least the first half of 1940. He would not even talk about it. He talked about a volunteer uh, army, which wouldn't have worked back then. Um, so it took uh, Henry Stimson, who, who came in as a Republican to the administration after the convention in, in the summer of 1940. And Henry Stimson was a Secretary of War under Trat Taft. He was Secretary of State under Hoover. He had huge influence. And Stimson, when he was confirmed by the Senate, uh, told the Senate he was going to advocate a draft. And so he was the one who, who, who took the initiative. And as soon as he did, Marshall stepped in, and both of them convinced Congress to enact a draft in the presidential election year, October uh, of 1940, 40, 1940, well before we were in the, more than a year before we got into the war. But they had to compromise in order to get that legislation through. And uh, the compromise involved uh, the draft being, uh, uh, the draftees would only be in service uh, for 18 months, unless the Congress declared a national emergency, all the draftees could go home. And that was part of the compromise back in 1940. Well, in 1941, uh, Marshall and Stimson uh, just by the skin of their teeth, by one vote, they got uh, the Congress to declare a national emergency in 1941, a couple months before Pearl Harbor. So the army did not melt away. So they had an army. And then they got the war materiel. <clears throat> they got the war materiel. But the problem with that was that, mo that the president wanted to sell it or loan it to the British and the French before they were defeated, and also to the Soviet Union when they got in the war. So Marshall had a terrible time trying to uh, keep the war material that he would need in order to train his troops. And he did that. And finally, talent. And that was no problem for Marshall because in the late 20s and 30s, he kept a mythical black book because he evaluated and he assessed. He got to know almost 200 of the, of the army officers who became generals in the next war. And he was a master. He made some mistakes, but he was a master at picking talent. So by the time Pearl Harbor happened, we at least had the making of a war. That's how he, that's how he did it. Washington had a pretty good opportunity. Uh, yes, he did. You know, choosing men like uh, Alexander Hamilton for his uh, 
Uh, he had problems with, uh, with, 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 with some, he had some opponents. There was a, a general named Charles Lee who uh, had the nickname Boiling Water. Uh, and in 1778, uh, he, he had, and he had a lot of support in Congress for this. He, he proposed, he, he thought that Washington's, well, Washington was, was fighting the war with too much lassitude. And he was going to take over and he was going to, to uh, adopt guerrilla tactics. So the, the light cavalry tactics, which were then in vogue in, in, in Europe. And Washington was violently opposed to it because he understood the social and political ramifications uh, of, of this. He says, uh, as one military historian wrote, he said this this would simply result in a war of uh, of uh, raids, reprisals, counter reprisals. Uh, the civilian population you know, would be would be uh, would be much more involved, would be devastated. The violence uh, on, on a local scale would be appalling, and there would be no overall strategy. But Lee, in the end, but Washington had to, had to fight to, you know, to, to preserve his position and to preserve his strategy uh, in, in, in the Congress. I want to return for one second uh, back to the Henry Richmond, in that Washington's thinking, sentiment, and race involved during the yeah, absolutely. The subject of your book. Yeah, I, 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 I could be with you for right. the next three hours on that. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. But I, w I want to ask, I want to ask Dave, what about Marshall and, and his relationship to the attitude about race? Yeah, yeah, see, and see, it's very different than uh, in George Washington. Uh, that that draft legislation also had a provision in it. Uh, in 1940 and 41, uh, anti-discrimination provision. But uh, discrimination meant something much different uh, than what it does today, apparently, uh, to Marshall and to the uh, and to the president and to the uh, uh, to the people in general. And basically, Marshall uh, decreed that uh, uh, they could have a some black units, but they would be all black. There would be no mixing. There would be no mixing of whites and blacks at the regimental level and below. And the regiments at that, at that time were three to five thousand men. So there was no real uh, mixing of the uh, of the uh, white and, and uh, African American uh, soldiers uh, virtually. And he ba and Roosevelt or Marshall basically said, well, "I'm not going to engage in social." Experimentation. This is not the time to engage in social experimentation. Now there was some mixing below the regimental level later on in the war, but that was how it that was how it began. Marshall um, had the stature and uh, and uh, probably the, uh, it gained enough influence to really have an impact if he wanted to. He had uh, his experience. Uh, at Fort Benning in the, in the late 20s and early 30s, uh, there was a, a white regiment at Fort Benning. This is in, in uh, rural Georgia, uh, near Columbus, Georgia. And there was a an all-black regiment on the base at Fort Benning. And Marshall was there to run the academic building. The all-black regiment, I think it was the 25th uh, infantry regiment, were basically manual labor. They weren't allowed to carry a rifle. Uh, all they did, and they lived in shacks, uh, but basically they, you know, cut the lawn, they built the barracks. Uh, they had nothing to do uh, with uh, training, and Marshall was indifferent to that. So he also mixed with the, uh, the Hoy Polloi in uh, Columbus, Georgia, and at the time there was a, a, a firebrand editor in Columbus, Georgia. Marshall spent a lot of time over there in the Rotary Club and, and uh, socializing and riding and hunting with those people. And, and this firebrand editor had won a Pulitzer Prize you know, in the 1920s um, concerning uh, racial issues, uh, main, mainly uh, lynching. But Marshall knew, he, he knew, he could have made some inroads 
uh, during the Second World War. Um, but he was largely um, uh, indifferent. Was he racist? Um, my guess is he probably felt the black the inferior fighters. Uh, Persian uh, uh, had some of those attitudes. So I came out in my book um, saying basically that you know, he, he, <clears throat> that he probably was, uh, for the time that he lived in, racist. He could have done something about it, um, and he didn't. He neither did Roosevelt. So that was it's, it's different, as you will find out, uh, in terms of how George Washington handled it. Well, if I could just ask you a question, I mean, uh, uh, Mar you know, Marshall fought in World War One in the all-black 93rd Division. That's right was one of the most heroic and the most decorated in France. And, and yeah. so why do you think this did not make an impression? On you? Well, there were also problems after the war because there were, there were riots. Some of those regiments rioted in Texas and in the Deep South when they got back from the First World War. They were uppity and they were not, you know, they were not compliant as they had been before the war. So that's, that's the reason that regiment at Fort Benning was not allowed to carry guns, because they had been involved in an insurrection in Texas, because they were being mistreated. Yeah. The other thing that, you know, Marshall in later life regretted, he, he said he regretted, he regretted particularly the black uh, troops being trained down in the Deep South. He did that to save Hebrews. He did that, you know, and uh, I mean, it was just cheaper to train troops down, and they were they were really mistreated during the uh, during the Jim Crow uh, years, uh, uh, you know, during the Second World War. So Dave, at one point, I, I remember you talking about, about Marshall having a valley school transformation. So I'm curious how each handled those low points. Okay, I mean, what, what was, what was Marshall's Valley Forge moment? <laughs> this Valley Forge moment. Well, it, they were really the early months of the war, January and February 1942. And uh, they were the, they were, everything was going to hell. They didn't have enough uh, troops, they didn't have enough equipment, and the, the Japanese were just taking over all of these Asia. And so, when uh, Marshall, on evening, by this time he was married. To, he had a second marriage. He married to Catherine, a big part of his life. And he would come home from the office on these twilight, twilight uh, uh, winter evenings, and he would he would, he would have walks. He, he and Catherine would walk uh, in the in the near darkness. Uh, he lived over across the river at Porter's Warren, Fort Myers. Long walk, and, and Marshall would talk to me. Catherine wrote about it. She wrote a book about it. And not about that, about her life with Marshall. And he would say such things as, I cannot allow myself to get angry. He had to control his temper. I cannot allow myself to uh, appear tired to bring that composure. I cannot afford the luxury of sentiment. Mine must be cold logic, trying to control himself. Because he was, he had to tell MacArthur, he had to get a message to MacArthur that his troops in the Japan Peninsula were doing. He had promised rescue, but they couldn't get through the Japanese Navy. So the troops would have to surrender or die. Or he would tell his best friend, and some of his dear friends who were generals, that they were too old, that was the hardest thing for him, telling them they were too old to, to uh, control, to uh, these troops in combat. So these were, uh, these were the, when he, he, he summoned his steely vow, uh, he had to control himself, because each day uh, was, a, uh, was, a, was a challenge for him to, to get through it, and the hard decisions uh, that he had to make. Anyway, I won't ask what Washington Valley Forge moment was. There were several of them. Several Valley Forge. But how would you say, in general, Washington responded to those times? Because, as you pointed out before, the war effort 
It didn't go well for the American for long, long stretch. No, we came very close to losing that war. Um, and you get back to, the, to Washington's courage and his perseverance and his conviction that we would win in the end. And, uh, and he was also lucky. I mean, they were so lucky that one, one, one almost begins to think that, as there's a new book out saying, it was God's will that we, that, that, that we won that war. One of the, he, he got out of one of his worst fixes in New York after the, you know, the Battle of Long Island, where the Maryland line was slaughtered. And his, his back was to the East River. The British were about to close in and, and, and wipe out the American army. They had no way to escape. And suddenly, a huge storm rolls in, and this incredibly thick fog covers all of New York Harbor. And who comes to the rescue but a, a fleet of Marblehead, Massachusetts fishermen, including many African-American fishermen, who, under the cover of darkness and fog, ferry almost the entire army from uh, Brooklyn Heights over to Manhattan to escape for another day. Who could have, who could have, I mean, they had to fight their way through Manhattan and then there was more fighting in New Jersey, but still, no one could have predicted that. And at the end of the war, the very end, we, we, you know, we won in, in the fall of 1781, uh, the last battle was at Yorktown on the other side of Virginia. But in May of that month, Washington was in White Plains, New York, stuck. He wanted to recapture New York from the British, but he didn't have the manpower. He had uh, 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 highly trained and, and well-equipped French troops that were blockaded at Newport. He couldn't get them. And, uh, and he had no supplies. He had no money. The army was, I mean, there were a lot of blacks there who were still loyal to him in White Plains. The amazing thing, and I left it at home, unfortunately, is he wrote in his journal, and this is in May, Instead of having a glorious prospect with a strong strategy before us, we have gloom. And instead of having all of our equipment and men, we have nothing. And it was a real expression of, of almost of not, not just pessimism, but of fear. This could be the end. But he didn't give up. And lo and behold, in the coming weeks, he got two pieces of information. One, Lord Cornwallis, which he knew, and Benedict Arnold were loose in Virginia, laying waste wherever they could. And he got a message saying that Cornwallis had suddenly abandoned, you know, his raiding and had made camp at, uh, at, at Yorktown. And through an African-American spy, James Armstead, he learned that Cornwallis had no plans to leave there because he was waiting to be picked up by a British fleet. And he received a second piece of information, that the French had intercepted that fleet and had deflected it. So Washington ordered a fast march to Yorktown, surrounded Cornwallis, and all of a sudden the war is over. In May, he thinks that we're losing. In the fall, we have won. Um, and th that's how it, well, one of his uh, you know, Valley Forge moments turned around, and I think it was, you know, part of it was you know, his, his confidence, his faith in his men, and his, his determination, you know, never to give up. I mean, there was something that uh, somebody once said about why certain movie stars are, are so uh, attractive and mysterious to us. He knows, he's a, he, he does not know that he's a man who's going to win, but he knows he will never give up until he does. And I think that, that that paradoxical statement sums up Washington. Let me ask Henry a question about that. Um, well, so there's this book, uh, David Brooks wrote a book called The Road to Character. There's a chapter in there about uh, Marcia. And uh, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of uh, character um, that Brooks um, talked about, and I wrote about it uh, with Marcia, is the capacity to love and be loved. And my question to you is, and double question, but you know, what do you know about um, about Washington's uh, relationship with uh, Martha, with, with women? Was he sterile? Did he have the capacity to love and be loved? Uh, the, I think that there, there's very little question that um, he, he married Martha for her money. She was the richest woman in. Um, uh, in Virginia, having inherited an estate of about 40,000 pounds, mainly in land and enslaved people, 
uh, from her husband, first husband, Daniel Park Custis, who dropped dead uh, you know, of a heart attack or a stroke or something like that at age uh, 48. And uh, so Washington swooped in once again wearing his uniform and, and char charmed her, and they, and, they, and they were married. But they were never able to have children, and there's been a lot of speculation that it's because Martha had had four pregnancies and two surviving children. And Lynn, correct me if I'm wrong on the numbers of those. You probably know better than I. But I think there were four pregnancies. And um, so people assume that George Washington was sterile because she apparently never became pregnant after that. And I, I fell into conversation with an expert on smallpox because the thinking was that Washington had contracted smallpox in, uh, smallpox in Barbados and had survived, and that men who survive smallpox are rendered sterile. And the people have said this for, I don't know, 100 years. So I asked Professor Fenn, Elizabeth Fenn, who's written a great book called um, Pox Americana about the terrible smallpox epidemic that swept the East Coast, uh, POX, Pox Americana, that swept the Eastern Seaboard right in the middle of the revolution, uh, and it's exactly a terrible toll. I said, what is the connection that, as far as you know, between surviving smallpox and sterility. And she said, as far as she knew, only one modern study had been done and the correlation was zero. That it, just the fact that you had smallpox doesn't mean, mean that you can't become a father. So it's possible that Martha had a condition that, that is called um, secondary infertility. Once that a woman has had a certain number of children, for one reason or another, in infection or something else, she cannot conceive again or she cannot carry the term. So who, who knows? But um, Washington uh, did not have any children. One of the reasons, uh, as a sidebar, when my book on George Washington came out and it won, won a prize, uh, uh, it was banned at the Mount Vernon Bookstore. Uh, and b because I devoted a chapter to studying the question which had just one of the reasons I wrote the book, actually, is that uh, the Sally Hemings Jefferson thing had come out. And then not long after that, some women who were descended from people who had been held in slavery at Mount Vernon came forward and said, George Washington is our great, great, great grandfather. He, he had a child with a, with a slave woman named Venus, and that child was West Ford, who was the manager at, at Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon looked into the records and said it was impossible that they, Venus and George were not in the right place at the right time you know, to have this happen. Uh, and actually, the, the West Ford was, was fathered by one of his nephews or his brother. And then Mount Vernon walked away from the issue. And I thought, wait a minute, Mount Vernon has just admitted that George Washington had black skin. Doesn't that get on the front page somewhere? And does this somehow play into his decision to free his slaves? So I dug into this very, very, very deeply, and I won't go into the whole thing, but I found a, a very important document that Mount Vernon had overlooked and wrote a chapter about it in, in concluding that I didn't think it was likely, but it was possible. And they, they didn't like that. They, did, they disliked that so much that they banned, uh, ban banned the book for a while. I won't go into the rest of the story. Well, after the lecture, we're selling it in our shop, so it's not there. Well, I would turn that question back maybe to, to conclude with, with Martha, give, give me an example, Martha's ability to love and be loved. Why not? Yeah, I mean, That's a good so Marshall, um, Marshall, George Marshall had met his first wife, Lily Carter Cole, in, in, the, in the fall of the senior year <coughs> at the... Uh, and uh, she lived with her mother, who was older than uh, she didn't know what middle age. Lily was older than Martha, and she lived with her mother in Lecture Avenue, just beyond the uh, VMI limit gate. And Marshall was totally in love with her, um, and he risked the marriage. He was first captain in that fall of the senior year. He risked the marriage. He risked his position as first captain by seeing her at night. Uh, in, in that house uh, where she lived with her mother. And on, on his wedding night, 1902, at the New Willard Hotel in, in Washington, uh, Marshall learned that Lily could not withstand pregnancy due to uh, 
congenital heart condition. And there are very few letters that survive um, that uh, they were married for 25 years, the child. Was. And uh, there are very few letters, I think they've been destroyed probably by Marshall's by Marshall second one, or by Marshall himself. Um, but uh, one of the letters does reveal intimacy that, that I regard given the euphemism of the day, sexual nature. Lily died in 1927, uh, having, having survived the dangerous operation of the new earth and set the thyroid um, days after, uh, days after the operation, she was at the Walter Reed Learning Hospital in Washington. Uh, she was writing a letter to her mother and <coughs> her heart stopped. Uh, and uh, she, uh, the last word she wrote was, George was devastated. Uh, and that's uh, when he, he, he wrote some letters to Jim McCurdy about that. Well, we could go on and on and on, but I would like to leave a couple minutes here to entertain some questions for you all. But if uh, anybody has it, please stand up and speak up so we can hear and then we'll repeat the question. Yeah, um, well, I'm sorry. Would you, would you talk about the role that Admiral Leahy played in getting Marshall his five-star rank? Um, well, let me just tell you, first of all, that one reason why I was inspired to write this book, or to continue writing it, um, a book came out uh, in recent years uh, recently written by a man named O'Brien, Englishman. The title of the book was The Second Most Important Person in the World, The Life of General Admiral Leahy. And just the premise uh, shocked me. Uh, and the... Uh, Is it really indispensable now? And the book was devoted to, to trying to argue, to arguing that Leahy was much more influential in all the strategic decisions of World War II than Marshall. There's even a, there's even a, uh, like a spread, a spread page, uh, you know, a, a diagram trying to, to make that case. So that uh, really inspired me to uh, uh, continue writing um, and. So, Marshall was responsible for bringing Leahy into the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, as, uh, because they wanted to balance it out with two Navy and two Army. Uh, and he felt it was, it was important uh, to uh, have that balance. So, by the time Leahy got into the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the major strategic decision of the war had already been made. Uh, <clears throat> which was to go into North Africa instead of France in 1942. Uh, so, so there's very little documentation of exactly what Leahy was supposed to be doing behind the scenes. We know that he was a great friend of the president and he used to be in the children's hour, the cocktail hour that, Mar or that Roosevelt always had. Marshall stayed away from all that stuff. So, there was a movement near the end of the war to, uh, to uh, confer an additional star. At that point, the, 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 everybody was a, the top generals were four stars. Marshall was a four star. But Leahy wanted to uh, promote the idea of, of uh, granting fifth stars to MacArthur, uh, Marshall, Cap Arnold, uh, Ernie King, and Admiral. Uh, and uh, so I think, I think Leahy was influential. Marshall didn't want that to happen. And he certainly didn't want to diminish uh, Pershing's standing uh, from the First World War. So he was against it, but it, it did get through. And eventually, I think there were nine uh, additional stars conferred. And I think Leahy did have a role in that. 
I don't think that's you know a particularly significant uh, role in, the, in you know in terms of substance of uh, accomplishment. But I do believe we had a, had a role in that. Another question, Tony. Uh, the questioner asked about the uh, about the faith in God of of each man and what role that may have played in his in his career. Um, it's hard to say how deep George Washington's faith was. I mean, he did attend services in in Virginia, but I don't think that he received communion. He was a member of the vestry, but that was a, a political body as much as a religious body because the vestry set the tax rate for the, for the county uh, because the, the vestry was responsible, the, 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 church, the churches were responsible for taking care of the poor and the income came from taxation and so it was the vestry that set the tax rate and you wanted to be on the vestry if you were a landowner. Um, there, there, there are the, the famous stories of George Washington kneeling in the, in the snow at, at, the, um, uh, at Valley Forge. I have no opinion as to whether or not that happened. I mean, it certainly it, it could have. Uh, I know that, J that Joseph Ellis, uh, many of whose opinions I have great, enormous respect for, says that, uh, wrote somewhere that the only place that Washington and Jefferson thought they were going after they died was in the ground. So, you know, I really tried to dig into that with, um, with Mark. There's no question. When he, whenever he was asked whether he was a Republican or a Democrat, he would always say, I'm an Episcopalian. Um, and he was. And he was, he, he was a, a regular churchgoer. Uh, I know that. He didn't talk about the depth of his faith. He, I, in all the letters that I looked at, uh, you know, in, in, in his intimate letters with Catherine, you know, a lot of them would survive. When he was off at uh, being Secretary of State for weeks in Russia or Paris or wherever, or, or uh, on his trips during World War II, he, there's not a word about, um, about God. But I'm convinced that he did believe in uh, that in God, in the higher power. He did talk about Jesus. Um, but I think he was a sort of a high church Episcopalian. He, he, uh, he, he, there was a particular friend of his, I can't remember his name now, he's in the book, uh, that he met, um, I think at Fort Benning, who was, at, uh, who was an army chaplain. And uh, he uh, remained friendly with him and he, and that that particular guy became um, a, a, a priest at the National Cathedral in Washington, and he was the one who uh, presided at Marshall's funeral, which was in the chapel at Fort Myer across the river from Washington. Um, his instructions for his funeral were, bury me simply. Uh, no fuss, in contrast to Pershing, who lied in state and had a case on, uh, or obviously uh, Roosevelt. Very me simply, no fuss. Uh, it was a short Episcopalian uh, burial service, um, and he was buried down there uh, just below. He had this, I think he had a very strong uh, relationship uh, that had something to do with uh, Episcopalian uh, with Sir, Sir, Dan, uh, Sir, Sir John Dill, who was the English representative, uh, Churchill's English representative to the, to the Joint Chiefs in Washington. And uh, Marshall managed to arrange to have a, an equestrian statue uh, of John Dill uh, atop his horse in Arlington Cemetery. He's the only uh, non-American uh, to be there. And they had a very, a very strong relationship, and, and Dill's wife and, and uh, Catherine. I did 
I, I, I thought I could find more evidence, uh, but I believe he had a very strong faith in God. 